Shall we rise up on our feet as we're preparing to have our ending prayer? And all those who able to rise, every head bowed, every heart open, every eye closed. Father, we thank you for the mercies that you have shown us, your grace, your kindness. Thank you, God, because you're always sovereign and control of everything. And God, you're so gracious, God, not to be unmerciful towards us, God. Many failures we have, many failures you made. But God, I thank you, God, that in between it, God, you find your grace and mercy to yet be extended upon us. And so, Lord, tonight I ask of you, Lord, that you touch every eye, every ear, every heart, that God will be able to receive and see. Open our eyes that we may see the impartation of your word. Touch these lips of clay. Touch every ear that's hearing. Allow the word to go forth, enter into us, and cause us to grow. I pray growth all over the house, strength all over the house, and that your will be done in earth like heaven. Pray for every teacher, every classroom. God, that every student, God, comes to a greater understanding of who it is you are, that we'll walk as you would have us to walk. And we give you the praise and the honor. And it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. And everybody said amen. Amen. Well, praise the Lord to everyone. Amen. It's good to be in the household of faith tonight uh, to bless the name of the Lord. How many is ready to learn and hear of the word? Amen. All right. Well, we got some things we want to pour out and share on tonight. And I believe God's going to help us and Speak to our hearts as we go through this word tonight. As we have been talking about from the subject of postmodernism, of what is the modern way of doing things. Another way of saying that and my purpose is uh, how can and what should we do about things that are happening today? How do we approach it? What wisdom or information do we need? Uh, this is the area of where I am. So as I've been teaching on this subject, uh, postmodernism and the postmodern church and the postmodern world. And so I'm going to pick up from where we left off on last week and we shared one of the things that we must be aware of and there is a big discrepancy in some, in some cases. As we go on to slide number 25, uh, how does postmodernism affect us and our theology today? And there's going to be some things we're going to get into or maybe even talk about that uh, I like approaching that the church don't want to talk about. Amen. Last week we talked about pluralism and a pluralism and diversity, where one of the things that we discussed is how in this day and time women, women being in the pulpit, women uh, having a place in the church, and things of that nature. And I think we covered it pretty good on last week on what Paul meant when he talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Uh, it talks about, and the women should keep silence in the church. And we talked about why Apostle Paul dealt with that. Uh, tonight, as we move forward, I want to deal with uh, the second thing to this, and it's called the destruction of authority. Destruction of authority. So postmodernism, one of the challenges uh, that we're having in traditional sources of authority and encourages uh, critical examination of power dynamics within the theological institutions and structures of the church. And so I want to deal with this thing of destruction of authority, destruction, and some of the things in which we are fighting and battling on today. And when we talk about authority, uh, in this day and time, it is worthy to know that there was a day and time when positions and people in positions were important and they mattered. We are living in a day and time where now everything about authority is challenged. And when you go to school and you have teachers teaching their students that if your mommy or daddy spanks you, call the police. That's called destruction of authority. Others call it um, the social protection. And so these are some of the things in which we're fighting in our world today. Now let me give you a little bit of that. Go to Matthew chapter number 20. 
Matthew chapter 20, we're going to read beginning at verse number 20, some of the things in which Jesus is going to impart into his disciples. And we're going to get into some other things as well. But I want to start here. And if you have St. Matthew chapter 20 and verse 20, say amen. And those who may not have a Bible, you can look on the screen and follow us on the screen. What does it say beginning at verse number 20? Shall we read? Then came to him the mother of Zebedee, uh huh. Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. Read. And he said unto her, what wilt thou? She says unto him, talking to Jesus, grant that these my two sons do what? May sit the one on the right hand and the other on the left. Read. In thy kingdom. Read on. But Jesus answered and said, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink of the cup that I drink from? Read. And to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? Read. They said unto him, we are able. And that's a difficulty. I want us to pause right there. They say that we are able. Now let's examine the text. So we have the mother of the sons of Zebedee. Zebedee is, is the disciples of Jesus. And they've seen the authority of Jesus, and they've seen how Jesus has healed. They, they watched how Jesus has fed the multitudes. They watched how Jesus has took fish and loaves and multiplied it. The more he broke it, the more it multiplied They've seen these things happen with Jesus, and after viewing these things from Jesus, they want this kind of authority. And they asked Jesus a particular question, said, uh, and the mother asked, and she brings her son, please allow my mother and my two sons, the mother is asking, one to sit on the left, the other on the right. And Jesus' reply is, Do, are you able to drink of the cup that I drink from. And I want to pause right there because Jesus was not dealing with a natural cup. He was not referring to picking up a cup and drinking it. Jesus' references here is regarding suffering. Are you able to drink of my suffering? And they said, yes, we can do it. And he said, you shall indeed. One of the things that must be understood in this thing of that I'm calling the destruction of authority is it must be understood just because you have power or just because you have an authority does not mean everybody respects you in it. And one of the things that needs to be understood in this day and time, there is constant criticism among those in power. Uh, we take those running from the president President of the United States is considered to be one of the most powerful positions in the world. One of the most powerful positions. But as soon as we start talking about those who's running, the people we automatically put our preference and what we think about them on the line. I don't care whether or not you're a Democrat doesn't matter if you're a Republican. Doesn't matter if you're a Biden in Biden's camp or a Trumpster. Either way it goes, you're going to get attacked. Jesus is saying to these disciples, can you handle the attack of what will come? Being in leadership is dangerous. I don't care what group over here likes them. There's another group that can't stand them. And even... Myself, being here at the Believers in Christ, I've been pastoring 31 years total. I've been pastoring in this particular church two years. It would be ignorant of me to believe that everybody accepts it. 
One of the things we must understand in the power of leadership in this day and time and in postmodernism and postmodern leadership, everybody needs to accept the fact when you're in leadership, everybody will not like you. Everybody's not going to accept you. And this is a prominent thing in this day and time. If you take on a new job and you become somebody's boss and you're the new manager, don't think that everybody under you like you. And please do not accept the thought that because you're in this position, everybody accepts you in your position. And even if you receive the pay that they promised you, doesn't mean those that you lead accepts the fact you get it. In this confine of what we talk about in postmodernism, there is a deconstruction of authority. There must be an understanding there's always somebody out to tear you down. It comes with it. Anybody who desires, and we can say all day long, Lord, use me. God, use me. Lord, I want you to use me. This is the same thing these sons of Zebedee are saying. Lord, I want you to use my son. And Jesus said, I can use him, but can you handle the pain? Can you handle the hit? Can you take the slap? Can you take the bats? The same time that we, we have just come through Resurrection Week and Palm Sunday, Jesus has been worshiped and praised and spoken as Hosanna. By the end of the week, the same people that praised him said, kill him. Deconstruction of modernism of authority. Everybody must understand there's a price to be paid to walk in authority. Go with me to James chapter 3. I want to show you something. James chapter 3. And I believe I want verse number one. And after we share this, I'm going to move to another part. James chapter 3, verse 1. What does it say in verse 1? My brethren, be not many masters. Now pause. This word masters is translated teachers. And he's speaking to the church in Jerusalem specifically. Be not many masters. Read. Knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. Anybody in leadership, and I promise you, I want to encourage anybody that God called you to preach, preach. God called you to teach, teach. Do what God has called you. But do understand there's a greater burden that comes with it. What is the greater burden? One of the things that happens when you get into leadership, people watch you that you have no idea that's watching you. And not only are they watching you, some people are watching you to fall and fail. Some people want to see you fall so they have something to talk about. Your failure becomes their pleasure. And so in this day and time, it must be understood. If you accept a call, you ask God to use you, here's what Jesus tells his disciples. If any man comes after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow. You cannot go and follow after Jesus without a cross to bear. Everybody's going to bear some kind of cross. And sometimes your cross are the people you sit with, live with, lay with, talk with, and some of them work with you. You have to know that there are people who you least expect that will turn on you. It comes with walking in this kind of authority. So when you ask God to use you, make sure you understand being used comes with the cross. Being used comes with the price. And the question that has to be asked, and you have to be willing to answer, am I willing to bear this cross? Jesus must, you must understand with Jesus, when he tells his disciples, if any man comes after me, he has to deny himself, take up his cross. Remember before Jesus took up the cross, they whipped him beyond recognition. So on his back is a tree with barks. There's no smooth and they didn't take off the barks. No, the barks were still on it. So imagine the barks being planted in his back and he's made to carry it. Imagine that they took uh, rose bushes 
and they tied him together and pressed him on his head. You cannot expect to lead without being attacked. Many a times, your authority attracts problems. Amen? I want to go to this other one. Go back to our PowerPoint, if you would. Thank you, media team. And we're talking about, in this particular part, how does the postmodern or how is modernism affecting what we do today in our theology? And I want to deal with this word, interdisciplinary approaches. This is one of the ways, and I want to explain what this means. Postmodernism blurs the lines of boundaries between disciplines leading to interdisciplinary, which is combining two or more academic fields within theology that draw on insights from philosophy, sociology, and psychology and other fields. Now, let me explain what this means. I thought all we have is the Bible. I think there needs to be an understanding in this day and time, in order to help people in this day and time, there is a need to understand psychology and theology go together. There's a need to understand sociology and theology goes together. Because one of the things that happens as you lead people, you have to learn habits. People are showing you every day what they think, even if they don't open their mouth. I have watched over my years of pastoring, and some of you may have recognized this too. When a person begins to backslide, it doesn't happen immediately. It is nothing that happens quickly, and neither does it happen overnight. It is a gradual thing that happens. I've watched people start at the front row, and before you know it, they at the middle row, from the middle row to the back row, and then they begin to start coming every other Sunday, then they miss and start coming once a Sunday, and then you miss them totally. It never happens totally. People are showing you where they are just by habits. And everybody who does that doesn't necessarily mean they're backsliding, because sometimes they mean I'm going somewhere else. And you got to learn how to read Body language. This is a part of sociology. I want to I want to help you all and show you a scripture. Um, go to the book of Corinthians. Paul Pauline epistles have all kind of stuff in. But I want to show you the theology. But I also want you to see why sociology and psychology plays a part into it. Has there anybody in here ever taken a psychology class? Anybody? All right. Awesome. Anybody has taken a sociology class or has a sociology degree? Perfect. All right. We can ready to do some. We can ready to do some explaining, not explaining. We're gonna do some explaining. So <laughs> I want y'all to go with me to Second Corinthians, chapter eleven, and I want you to view something. And I want to start at verse. Uh, let's start at verse 23. Uh, let's start at 21. And I don't want you to follow what's happening, and then we're going to dissect what is going on in the text. Are you there? All right. Verse, what did I tell y'all? 21? All right, let's start. What does it say? Paul says what? I speak, verse 20, I speak as concerning reproach, as though we had been weak. Watch this word weak. Read. How be it? Wheresoever. Any is bold. I speak foolishly. Read. He said, I am bold also. Anybody says they're bold, I'm bold too. Read on, Paul. Read on, y'all. Let's see what Paul says. Are they Hebrews? I'm a Hebrew too. Are they Israelites? I'm an Israelite too. Are they the seed of Abraham? I'm the seed of Abraham. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. More in what? In labors. More abundant. In stripes. Above measures. In prisons. More frequent. In deaths. Often, my life has been challenged on a regular basis. I'm facing all of this. Verse 24, what does he say? Of the Jews, 
Five times I received 40 stripes save one. Now you have to pause to know what Paul said. It was a known fact if you got beat beyond 39, you were supposed to die. Paul said five times I was beat beyond that. They beat me past 40 trying to kill me. How many times he says it? It happened five times. On five occasions, who beat him? The Jews, his own people. I want you to follow this. Now pick up and read on. Verse 25. Thrice I was beaten with rods. One stone. Three times I suffered shipwreck. At night and a day I have been in the deep. Meaning he had been just treading water where he was out in the open. Paul said, this happened to me. Now, I want you to watch what Paul is telling us, and I want you to understand where we are based in postmodernism. What else does he say? Read. In journeyings, often. The word perils mean dangers. In perils are dangers of water. In perils of robbers. In danger of my own countrymen. In danger of perils by the heathen. Pearls in the city. I've been in danger in the wilderness. In dangers in the sea. And perils among false brethren. Paul's telling us his testimony. All the things he's gone, going through. For doing what? For carrying the gospel. Let's pick up and read on. What does he say? What else? In weariness and painfulness. In watchings often. I went hungry and thirsty. In fasting, I did it often. What else? In cold and nakedness. I've been cold without clothes. There's times when Paul was waiting in the water, he had nothing on. Freezing cold water. And when he says dangers about the waters, he's talking about there were, there were sea creatures, sharks and everything in that same water. And Paul was stuck in the middle of it trying to get people to be saved. And the very folks he preached to are the very folks who's beating him. This is what he's saying. Now I want you to go on and let's see what else Paul says. Verse 28. Beside those things that are without, the stuff that I deal with daily, the care of all the churches I pastor, who's weak, who don't go through stuff? And I can't be weak. Who's offended? And I'm not angry because I've been offended. Read. If I must need to glory, what is he going to glory in? I will glory in the things which concerns, this word infirmities mean, all of the things I've gone through. I'll glory in God for it. Read. For the God and Father of of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, know that I ain't telling the story. I've been through every bit of this. I'm not making up nothing I've told you. Now, I want you to put yourself in Apostle Paul's place and ask yourself the question, if I've been through all of that, what would I be like? How would I feel? How much would I feel like wanting to preach to people who stoned me? He said three times they stoned me and beat me with rods. I've been in journeys often. I've been locked up in prison. Now, I want to show you what happens to Paul as he has gone through this. And I want us to understand in being saved, you're going to go through some stuff and quit letting people tell you because you go through stuff. He'll keep your mind in perfect peace and stay on it. He will, but there's some stuff that ain't peaceful. Lord have mercy. If I can just get some real folk up in the church. If I've been through what Paul been through and you still holler about I'm saved, I want y'all to watch Paul go to the next chapter. Let's see what Paul says now. I want you to, we, we're, we're using interdisciplinary actions and I'm going to show you where Paul is now watch beginning at verse number one what does he say 
It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. Read. I'll come to visions and revelations of the Lord. Huh. Verse 2. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. Whether it happened in the body, I'm not sure. Or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows. Read. Such a one caught up to the third heaven. And verse 3. I knew such a man. Whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows. Verse 4. How did he was caught up into paradise? Where's that? Where's that? I want you to, uh, heaven. Is that what y'all saying? Let's continue to read and see where he's at. Mm-hmm. Read. And I heard them what? S unspeakable words, which is not lawful. Stop. Pause. Who is Paul talking about? Oh, this is a good question. Who is John talking about that was caught up? He's in chapter 12. He just got finished in chapter 11, telling us all the stuff he had went through. He then jumps over here and says, I cannot tell, but the Lord knows. He's talking about himself. Why didn't he say that in the text? For what? For the sake of humility. That's a great answer. Why do you say? You've been through sociology. You've taken a psychology class. Paul is now telling us he knows a person, but I cannot tell you. They went to the third heaven. Where is that? He said paradise. But then he says, I heard things that were spoken. I can't tell you. But this happens after he went through all of these things. I'm showing you the combining of interdisciplinary things. How does this challenge theology? This is the thing. I'm not here to confuse nobody. I'm here to help you and show you some stuff in scripture. Why doesn't he not tell us who it is? Why is it judged of what? But judge him for what? You're hot. Say that louder. Somebody come get this mic. I, I remember we on live stream. I know we in the room, but thank you, Brother AJ. I appreciate it. Go back there, take the mic, because I want us back here in the back. She said, I don't want this mic. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Take it to Sister Sharon. Take it to Sister Sharon. And Sister Sharon, I want you to tell us why is it that Paul is not saying it was him? Because it was like a psychological warfare going on in his mind. That right there. Paul's going through in his head. And Paul is now saying, I know of a man I cannot tell. And you know what we call that today when a person is hearing stuff but can't tell us what they're hearing? No, somebody get that mic. Schizophrenia. Schizophrenia. And there is a such thing as, say that louder, bipolarism. A bipolar, bi means two, polar means personality. There's two personalities going on here. I want y'all to see how this plays out in the scriptures, and I need you to understand something in this day and time that we are bypassing because we want to make everything the devil. And I want to say up front, everything's not the devil. There's stuff that's bigger than that. Paul tells us in chapter 11 all the stuff he has gone through. And he says, I don't lie. He says, I can't make this stuff up. Where was he beaten? He said, three times I was beaten. My question to you, what was beaten on him? Give me an imagination. What got hit? Give me one that would affect your thinking. Your head. When... His what head. He got hit in the head. He said, I got hit in the head with 
post. He called it pipes. You mean to tell me if you got beat in the head past 40 times and it happened three times with a pole that your mind is saying? This is what's wrong and the church has to wake up. Some people coming in don't have demons. They have mental conditions. Y'all ain't talking. Preach, Pastor. I'm trying not to. I'm trying to teach. There are in the church we have got to stop bypassing what is happening to people mentally. And we want to judge everything as a demon. And I'm here to tell you, demons are real. But so is mental illness. And some mental illnesses are induced. Paul's word, and this is called, and I'm giving you a psychological term, PSD. PTSD, thank you. PTSD. What is that? Post tra traumatic stress disorder. There are things you can go through that will drive you crazy. And the church wants to rebuke you when you go through stuff. And I'm saying, stop. Keep your mouth off of people. You don't know what they've been through. Stop. Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, I believe it's around verse 22 and 23. I don't have time to get into it. But when they brought the sick among him, one of the courses of who he healed was people who had mental conditions. Mental illness is a real illness and we play it down and make it all the devil. It's not. PTSD is real. Depression trauma is real. And what we don't do is believe this stuff happens. As a pastor, why did you go and get education? Because I needed to know how to deal with people who need pastoral counseling. And we can't just sit up there and say, I'm going to pray for you. I am. But let's deal with your issue. And some stuff is a diagnosis. And you can't deal with everybody's problem the same. And stop telling people, ain't nothing wrong with them. Yes, it is. Mental illness is in the church. You can't have the Holy Ghost of mental illness. You got it and don't know it. Did I just say that? I said it. People who think it does not exist has a problem. It's called being unaware and is walking in denial. Apostle Paul gets into chapter 12. You read it, you read it yourself. I can diagnose it. Because we've been trained to do it. And this is why training is necessary. When people, every time they get with you, they want to tell you about their problems, they're making you their therapist. I'm going to give you the scripture. Give them a scripture. Give them the scripture. But give them skills to help them to get to deliverance. Some people need salvation in their head. We're trying to get it in their feet, and folks need to separate and deal with the fact you were raped as a child. And we want to just buy, no, you can't. They're traumatized. Why do, they, why do they always come off angry? You don't know how they were beaten. Paul says it in the text. You angry and I'm not? Oh, you read it. You can't say I didn't. You, you can't tell me. I made sure y'all read it. <laughs> there are people in the church who are suffering from PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. It's a real deal. If you if you ever been put in a traumatic household and was raised by parents who had trauma, they often took the trauma out on you. Let's just deal with it. And so what the church does is, is sweep it under the rug and say, that ain't nothing but the devil. You can call it what you want, but there's an illness there. And there's some things anointing you with oil and laying hands on you won't heal. And I believe in laying hands and pouring oil. 
But let's get down to the brass tacks. And the only way you can get something down to its lowest common denominator, you have to break it down. There's people in the church who are suffering from social dynamics that are real. I, I often wondered why my mom and Pastor Outlaw never talked about their grandparents. And we just have such great memories of our grandparents. And I was wondering, wow, did they have, I want to hear their stories. And I never heard the story, so I went digging. And I come to find out, my cousin Valerie and I, we come through the same line of the Islanders, and we are the children of Blanche and Ike. Well, who was Blanche and Ike? Ike was born in 1849. Slavery ended in 1863. Ike was born in 1849. Slavery ended in 1863. That's on paper. My grandparents were directly raised by ex-slaves. And that is important because it'll show you where the trauma happened. His wife was born in 1883, Blanche. There's a big age gap. They have five children. My grandfather's one of them, her father was the other one, out of the five. And from this, you start seeing trauma. Here's a noted fact that we need to know. Everybody in this room, we all can live out at least 14 generations back what trauma they went through still lives in you and me. 14, you taking psychology? I'm telling you what I know. 14 generations. Now you take all of that, your parents' stuff, your grandparents' stuff, your great-grandparents' stuff, 14 generations back, and we are still living out their trauma today. So when you see an Apostle Paul, trauma exists. Anybody know how Paul died? How did Paul die, Apostle Paul? He got his head chopped off. And history tells us he ran to the chopping block. He couldn't wait to get out of here. Tired of dealing with life. And so when we see folk coming in the church and they're hollering about they su suicidal, we want, oh, you just need to tarry. No, you need to talk. Woo, Jesus. Everybody in this room has experienced trauma of some kind. And what I'm doing is telling you theology, psychology, and sociology all goes together. How does this word deal with my problem? And this is what preaching and teaching has to do is show people how can I get help for what I'm going through or what it is I've gone through. When you see people who abuse alcohol, it ain't the alcohol's the problem. It's what they're suffering and trying to drown out. When people are smoking dope, they smoke dope to drown out the voices. Ah. They're not doing it because they want the problem. They're tired of the voices talking to them. And sometimes the voices cause them to become violent. People with alcohol, alcoholism abuse, they suffer from depression. And the only time they can get a lift up is to go down. And so they drink themselves into that problem. Without knowing this, we give them a word and don't know which word to give them. That's like telling somebody with high blood pressure, take a, a diabetes medicine. And they don't have diabetes. We, we mix it up. Here in the scriptures, Apostle Paul is going through right here. Who is he? Apostle Paul. Why do you note that? I don't care what anointing is on your life. We got to stop believing that because you're anointed, I don't go through nothing. No, because you're anointed, you're probably going to go through more. When Jesus was at the cross, Jesus is God. Yes, he is. But on the cross, he was a man. Am I right, Elder? That was not God on the cross. That was a man on the cross. And he screamed out at the cross and says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
He was depressed. He couldn't understand I did everything right and everything wrong is happening. Don't tell me in this room you've never experienced that. I followed your word and I got the worst. You need to hear. People, we live in a real world. When you leave Bible study, you're leaving Bible study, but you need something to help you. You need to know if you have two personalities and you need to listen to the people to say, you act one way, then you turn. They might be telling you something you shouldn't ignore. Oh, Father, help us tonight. I just need a t psychology, psycho, psych. Psyche deals with thinking. And sometimes what needs to happen, and hear me, uh, anybody ever been to a restaurant like Steakhouse, Bitahana, or, or what's that other one, Mount Masa? Anybody ever been to Steakhouse? Good, good. Now, when they bring your food out, I want you to stay with me. When they usher your food out, the chef, he takes your steak and, and all your food, he's going to line it up. But he has on his hip a sharp knife. Now, before he does anything or she does anything, they pull the knife out and do what? Sharpen it. They take a metal pole and they sharpen it. Now, I'm going to help you understand what's really happening. Why do you sharpen blades? All that's really happening is that the blade the more you use it, it bends up, but you can't see it. But when you put it against the pole, all the pole does is realign the blades back down. And that's what makes it sharp again. So they have to realign the blade. There comes a time in your spiritual walk, everybody needs to be realigned. Why do we need the word? Iron sharpens iron. And the word will sharpen you and bring you back into focus. There is a such thing you can be saved and out of alignment. And the body needs to be realigned. And you, you and I, we need somebody to help put us back into line, alignment. And that's why we use the word. I can diagnose you on this side. I use the word on this side to bring you back into focus. And there comes a time in your walk with God. Everybody needs to be brought back down. Is this making sense? So Apostle Paul, he's anointed. There's so many people got saved. Yes, and his wounds took him out of alignment. And so because he don't want nobody making fun of him, I know of a man I cannot tell. And so in this day and time, ministers of the gospel and those who went through Stibbs, how many in here went through Southern Theater? Okay, you got a biblical degree and you got a counseling degree, dual degree. Why did we put those together? Because it's needed for ministry. And you cannot operate in this day and time, in this day and time, just telling people it ain't nothing but the devil. But when you go home, who's stuck with you? <sighs> Lord, give us strength tonight. Let's, let's, let's do some more here. What is another one? Number four. I'm going to try to get relational theology. Postmodernism emphasizes the importance of a relational community leading to a renewed focus on the communal nature of faith and the role of relationships in shaping theological understanding. This has led to the development of relational and participatory models of theology prioritizes dialogue and engagement with others. Luke, go with me to Luke 19. What do you mean by this? I'm going to help you. What does it mean by relational theology? Everybody's not going to be one to the Lord over the pulpit. I want everybody to understand. This, what I'm teaching us, is really about how do we go about evangelizing. And I want y'all to write these words down. And when I finish this section, y'all got to bring me back and tell me, Bishop, what does this mean? I want you to write down the word quickening, quickening, and the word unction. Just write those down. Quickening and unction. And I'll bring us back to it, but I want to show you about relational theology. 
This is important. Luke chapter number 19, beginning at verse number 1. If you have it, say amen. What does it say? Let us read. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Read. And behold, there's a man named Zacharias, which was what? The chief among the who? Publicans and this verse is telling us something. Context means everything. This is going to tell us what is happening. He's a man that's rich and he's the chief or he's the head of all the publicans. You got to know what a publican is in order to know why that's important. This man's a tax collector. They run the money. They have it all. They strip. He's rich. Rich off of who? The poor. Got to know it. Verse 3. And he sought to see Jesus and who he was. And he couldn't for the press, meaning there were so many people around, he couldn't press through to see him. Read. Because he little dude. He little man. He little man. He got a complex. All right. Verse 4. And he ran before. So now he sees where Jesus is moving. And so he's going to run ahead of the crowd. And he does what? And he climbed up into a sycamore tree. So he's, he's going into a big tree. And so he can see him. For he was. He knew Jesus was going to pass this way. So I'm going to go run ahead of the crowd. I'm going to get in this tree so I can see who Jesus is. Woo, boy, that'll preach right there. Read on. Verse 5. And when Jesus got to that place. Jesus looks up and saw who? Zacharias and said unto him, Zach, Zacchaeus, I'm sorry, I said Zacharias. Zacchaeus, make haste or do it quickly. You come down here. For today, I must abide at your house. Remember, Zacchaeus, he's a publican. He's the chief among publicans. I'm going to give you just another scenario. So if he has 20 people under him, he's going to make money off of all the other ones up under him too. This is why he's rich. He's making bank. He's making money himself for what he's doing, and he's making money off of everybody up under him. And Jesus says, come here. Get down here. I'm going to your house. Let's see what he does. Verse number six. He made haste. He came down. And he received him happily. Read. And when they saw it, who's the they? Oh, we got to figure out who the they is. Whenever you read context of scripture, you got to find out who the author is talking to. And you got to find out who, who is in the crowd. Because he's talking to a specific group. And he, and he says the they. So who's the they? The Pharisees? Who's the they? The Jews, who's the they? That's the key. The they, they begin to all murmur. They begin to complain. Who is the they? The they is the crowd. The they are the people who have been taken advantage of by these publicans. The they are the folk who go to church all the time and they up, they're upset at these publicans. That they are those who are so happy that Jesus came to uproot that government and give him another government. But they are the they who is now murmuring, saying what? That he was gone to do what? Be guest with a man that is a sinner. Oh, no, Jesus didn't. Look at him. Don't you see Jesus going, he going down to Zacchaeus' house? How can he when he knows what they done did to us? When he, know, he knows they did it to his mom and him too. How can you go and say to him, I'm going to your house? It is amazing how it's the saints that complain when saints go somewhere with the sinner. Oh, I'm going to hit you in the head. Didn't the Bible say, Come ye out from among them and be ye separate? It did. 
But who was he talking to? Ooh. Let's continue to read. Verse 8. We're going to get to it. And? And he stood, said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods, I give it back to the poor. And if I've taken anything from any person by false accusation, I restore him fourfold, which means I give him back four times what it is that got taken from him. This is Zacchaeus talking. Read on. Verse number nine. Jesus said unto him, this day is salvation, is his present. This day is salvation. Come to this house for as so much as he also is the son of Abraham. Verse 10. For the son of man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Now, did not Jesus die for the world? Did not Jesus die to save the whole world? Do you believe in the scripture for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life? Then why do we pick who we want God to save? Mm. So let me go on down this tree. Jesus is walking. People knows he's walking, and he looks up in the tree. Zacchaeus, get down here in haste. You know what? Today I'm going to go with you to your house. And it's the church folk that condemns him. Now, and I have a question. Has anybody been fishing before? Where do you go? Then if you're going to win people to Christ, you can't go on dry ground. You got to go to where the fish are. If all we do is fish inside of the church, we're not fishing or evangelizing. If the only thing you do is go after your family members, you should. But you're going after no one else, you're not a fisherman. You're not evangelizing. Evangelism has to take place where sinners are. Oh, no, no, no. no he did. Yes, I did. Sinners don't hang out necessarily in church. So how are you going to win them? The Bible says, be ye separate and come out from among them. And the Bible says we should not, uh, light and darkness has no fellowship with them. You're absolutely right, the Bible says it. Now my next question is, show me where it says it. <laughs> Why would you ask that? Because a lot of times all we do is quote what somebody else said. A lot of the preaching that we've done is just rewarm preaching that we've heard. Show me where it says it. Okay, I'll show you. Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 6 so we can have context. Bishop, you playing dangerous. No, I'm playing. We're going to really evangelize. We're going to go to places where sinners are. You cannot fish on dry ground. Jesus says to Peter, come and I'll make you fisher, fishers of men. You cannot win people where you're not willing to go. How do we build in this day and time? I want everybody to hear what I'm saying. How do we get people to want to be saved? Number one, what's the theme? Relational theology. The number one way of winning people to the Lord today is building a relationship with them. You can't win people that you're not willing to have a relationship with. Tawana, raise your hand. Tawana, how long you been with me? Long time, about 25 years. She was invited by a person who had a serious lifestyle from the past. And someone else invited her to church. They all got saved. She went and got Tawana, who wasn't going to church, and Tawana comes. Where does she find Tawana? Not in church. But you'll find Tawana at church all the time now. If you're going to win people, ooh, you got to stop just doing church growth by having babies. Yeah, I went there. 
What do we do? You have to build relationships with people. Who all goes grocery shopping? Who all knows their cashier? You got to get to know people. You can't be afraid. Go and introduce, hey, I'm such and such. Who are you? Get to know them on first name basis. Which name basis? Which? First. Please don't go out there and start telling them, I'm elder so-and-so, I'm bishop so-and-so. No, they don't know what that is. Tell them your name. Here's what it says, Zacchaeus. Why did he say Zacchaeus? Because that's his name. Nobody called him Christ Jesus. They just called him, oh, we scared to do that. People, if you want to win people to the Lord today, it's got to be done through relationships. Everybody say relationships. Now I want you to go to 2 Corinthians. You got the microphone? Who got the microphone? Because I got a question over here, a comment or something. So help me out while we go there. Can I go over just a little bit tonight? Awesome. All right. Okay, so I work at a place where other, some saved people work at. Mm -hmm. So... I talk to this one individual mm -hmm. all the time. Yep. Well, this one minister mm -hmm. comes to this particular person one day mm -hmm. and says, God told me to tell you this, that. Mm -hmm. This person came, found me, and went off. Mm. She was hot on fire. Why? How God going to tell her something? She don't even speak to me mm. when she walked past wow. me. Wow. She ain't never held a conversation with me in her life. And then going to come up and tell me God told her something. I know who God is, this, this, that, and the other. So we got to be careful yes, how we treat people. And we should speak to people just because. Because how she's supposed to receive that when you a minister, but you never speak Talk to me, to you turn your nose up at me right. when you see me. But now you get elevated to another position. Now in work, now you want to come and say what God told you to tell me. And that is a huge issue. Jesus says, with love and kindness have I drawn thee. We have to become what Jesus was. We cannot expect to minister to people and we don't have kindness towards nobody but just our circle. It's got to stop. We have to be relational. It's nothing wrong with going to lunch with somebody that's not saved at your job. Why would they come to your church if you're just so mean? One of the fruits of the Spirit is kindness. Love wins people. Jesus says, then shall I know you are my disciple, that you have love for each other. There has to be a relationship of theology. So what does that mean? That what I believe about God is what I model. Say it with me. What I believe about God is what I model. Say it again. What I believe about God is what I show others. You just can't be nice to just save people. Mm -mm. Yes, ma'am. There's another hand back there. Brother AJ, I know I got you running and jumping, but I appreciate it so much. Wife is happy because she don't want you to be as big as me. Keep running. She wants you to stay slim and trim. I'm going to say this. Um, I just, you know, I always say I got to be who I am. Be it. I'm, I feel like it doesn't matter where a person comes from or what they look like. If you really, to me, like, if you really love people, mm -hmm. and you, I mean really love people, yes, Lord. they don't have to be in your family. No. they're not. Because to be honest, there is times I help people outside of my family before a blood relative sometimes. It depends on who needed at that time. Yes. There are people that really need help. And a lot of, and I'm going I'm to say this. See, like, I'm not going, I'm going to be honest. I don't care. What you see me do, like, what I'm saying, Bishop, I respect you, right? Sure. But I don't do nothing to impress you. Yes, please I don't. I do don't. nothing to impress pastors. Amen. I'm, I am running the race because I want to, I want, I am trying to, I am walking with God. Yes. And you can't, to me, in order for me to walk with God, I got to love people. There, I even got to love people that, whew, That's hard to love. That, I said it for you. You know. <laughs> <laughs> that you be thinking like, oh man, something wrong. Yeah, wrong with them. yeah. But when when you, if you really be honest with yourself, 
You can't, to me, I don't see how I can make it to heaven if I'm not being honest. Because God knows my heart. He knows my mindset. So no matter how much I, you know, see people at church, I love, I, like I pray. I pray for our families. I pray for our church families. Mm -hmm. But I also pray for people that I don't even know. Please like I've do been that. On, I've been yes. in the parking lot. Yes. I never knew the man. That man got to telling me stuff, and we got to talking. But I don't. I wasn't thumping my Bible at that man. No. I spoke to that man in the only language I knew how that could reach him. Love. When I when we got through, I really feel in my heart that man. He was appreciative of the conversation. He was telling me, you know, how he felt about he loved his wife and everything. But that man, in my heart, I feel like God showed me this man needs somebody to talk to. Yes. And I didn't care if he was scraggly, you know, long hair or whatever. But he was a human. Yes. He was a human. And I really believe that. How can you say you love God? If Whom you you the scripture at, says that. And, and you can look at a person and turn your nose. There's times when I'm going to be, be up in the church turning your nose up to one another. I'm and that ain't God. Uh, I, I want to say this as you come back. Love cannot be black. It cannot be white. It cannot be yellow. It can't. You cannot be prejudiced or racist hollering about you got the love of God in you. Love treats everybody with equality. We cannot build love and relationships of theology and win people to the Lord by picking and choosing what we're going to pick. Now with that, I want to come to 2 Corinthians, and I want us to read this. Oh, y'all going to let me just have just a few extra minutes tonight. 2 Corinthians chapter 16 or excuse me, chapter 6, verse 17. If we can read that together, what does it say? Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I want to I stop right there. Why did I bring this up? Because often this is preach from the standpoint you you don't hang out with sinners you don't do that listen if we're going to win the world i'm not telling nobody to do what sinners do but what i am said if you're going to go fishing this scripture ain't even talking about this this scripture is approaching and dealing with paganism and telling the church and here's what paganism in corinth is a greek place and they had multiple gods. it was called polytheistic where there are multiple gods and paul is telling the people don't you switch faith and when he says come out from among them he's talking about do not hang out and become a uh, uh, one by these paganistic believers people who don't even believe in our god there are people who believes in our god that might not have been baptized in his name, but they believe in God and they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That ain't who he's talking about separating from. He's talking about those who may be Islamic. And you know what? I dare you to love them. Because oftentimes, Islamics know the Bible like they do the Quran. And they can defend more of that than we can. So what he's talking about is people who don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He, he's saying don't defect from the faith. That's who those scriptures are for. Come out from among them. The them are the paganistic believers. There are people who may not come to this church, go to another type of church that you can be friends with. How are you going to ever win them and have Harmony of theology without having a conversation. We run from everybody and we put ourselves in boxes and that's not what Christ does. Are y'all hearing me tonight? I want to hit this last one and, and I promise y'all I'm going to let y'all go. Ooh, Lord have mercy. Go back to the slide. Hit number five. Contextualization. This is huge. Postmodernism highlights the importance of context in shaping meaning, meaning and interpretation, leading theologians to adopt contextual and culturally sensitive approaches to theology. This is huge. You cannot take a scripture and read it and don't know what its context is saying. This is how we come up with stuff that doesn't fit and we believe it. You got to 
I'm going to preach this until breath leaves me. Context, 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 context. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12 through 17, uh, for the sake of time, and then I'm going to show y'all something. Verse 12, what does it say? Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I'm a Paul, I'm a Paulus, I'm of Cephas, and I have Christ. Read. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Read. I'm glad I didn't baptize none of y'all. But Crispus and Gaius. Read. Lest any should say that I baptized in my own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I don't know if I baptized any other. Christ should be made of, we did it, he said I did it so that Christ would not be made of none effect. I want to pause right here because what was happening at Corinth, many of them was trying to say how they were better because they were baptized by certain people. And this was a separation. What does that got to do with now? This is what we do in denominationalism. Same thing. And we're divided. And God never intended for it. This is stuff we did. And so we think we're better because I came up this way. You came up that way. I got it. You don't have it. Stop. We will never get this right if we don't sit down and have conversations. And we're scared to do it. And I'm saying love does. I want to show you all something in 1 Samuel chapter 18 because these are the kind of things that context matters and what we're dealing with. And I'm going to make, I'm going to make myself stop right here. I ain't out of word. I'm just out of time. Y'all heard that before? Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 18, postmodernism and postmodern theology. If we can preach any message, I want us to preach the message of love. Y'all got that? I want you to read it. Watch it. Let's read. What does it say? No. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 1. Read. And it came to pass when we had made an end of speaking unto Saul. I want you to pay attention to this part. That the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. Pause. Go back and read it again because I'm going to open something to us. Read it again. And it came to pass when he had stopped speaking to who? Saul. That? Jonathan is Saul's son. The soul of Jonathan. Soul is your thinking ability. It's your intellect. It's your emotional state. The soul of Jonathan. Knit. Who was it knit to? Okay. Pause. Keep that in mind. Now pick up and read. Go back. And John loved him as his own soul. What book are we in? First Samuel, what chapter? What verse? In this day and time, there are churches that are huge on same-sex marriage and same-sex relationship. And this is the scripture they use. Ooh. I want you to see the scripture, though. And Saul loved David with his soul and loved him like himself. And this is the statement that happens between a man and woman in marriage. And this, in this day and time, is being used to push the same-sex agenda. Now, I'm going to give you one more. 
but I ain't going to have you run to it. In the book of Ruth, everybody dies and it's just left Ruth and Naomi. And Ruth said, you go on back and be with your family because I don't have any more sons for you to marry. And here's what is stated. Because I need y'all to understand postmodern theology. I think it's Ruth chapter 3. Wherever you lay is where I lay. Where you live is where I live. Your God should be my God. Your people should be my people. And what's not understood, that in Jewish culture, this was a part of the vows in the marriage ceremony. And so they're using this to say, she was saying, I'll marry you. Yeah, are y'all in the same church with me? In this day and time, a postmodern theology, they're using scripture to support their agenda. My homework assignment for you, go find out what happened. You go read the context. You have to go study out why did she say it and why two women are saying it to each other. And this is the justification and the church has to be able and aware on how to defend our faith. Because I promise you, in this day and time, this is an issue that is not going away. What if they're homosexual? Should you not talk to them? This is one of the things that's being said. There's a text because of time, I won't go there, where the disciples come to Jesus and says, because this is born, born, born blind. He was born blind. It's in the Bible. The disciples ask Jesus, who sinned, his mother or his father? And Jesus said, none of them. And what is being used is there are people who are born gay. Now, I see you, Deke. I'm, I'm with you. Oh, no. But now it's being taught scientifically in the medical world, a person can be born gay. Bishop, this is too much. We don't want this. It's going to confront you whether you want it or not. It's confronting us. How do we handle this? What do we do? What do we say? People are going to challenge your belief. How do you stand and fight that without getting angry? Because it's in the scriptures, and that's what they're using. And I say to everybody, who in here was not born a sinner? Who in here was not? Right. And if sin is in you, all of us have the proclivity to be exactly that. How do you defend it? I got a question here, comment. Oh, no, we need you in the mic because we on camera now. They need to hear what we saying. Yes, ma'am. Well, my, I don't know how to say theology, but my thought of that is when people say that they're born gay is the Bible says we were all born in sin and shaping, shaping in, in iniquity. iniquity. Uh -huh. So what, I mean, any one of us could feel like, you yeah. know, we were born gay. Yeah. I mean, uh -huh. because... The sin is in our Nature. members. That's yes. exactly right. Exactly. So in the sense, I guess they could say that. Yes. However, that's why they need the Holy Ghost. Sorry. Woo! You own hot road there. I do not argue with anybody who says they were born gay. I let them have it. Fine. You're right. You were. Chapter 3. John, you're right. This is why we have to be born again. So don't argue it. I don't care who it is. We all have to be born again. But we have to know what being born again means. It means literally we take on another nature. So don't argue if a person say they were born that. Let them have it. Yep. If you didn't sin, you could be. None of us. Paul says, such were some of you. So we can't argue that you can say all day long in here, no, that ain't me. Sin in your nature could be you. 
It just, your nature may have become a proclivity to something different. But I'm saying to everybody, everybody must be born again. So don't argue whether or not that is a, a, a thing that you can give them and God didn't do, don't argue it. Argue, be born again. I'm stopping. I'm, I'm well past. Oh, quickening. <clears throat> quickening. And thank you, Deacon, while he's collecting. What is the difference? Yes, sir. Quickening and unctioning. These are two things I need the church to know. Quickening and unctioning. What does it mean to be quickened? Anybody have a dictionary? Anybody have a thesaurus on your phone? Download it if you don't. Keep one near you. What does the word quickening mean? To be quickened. To make alive. Awesome. Now, the word unction, U-N-C-I, unction, U-N-C-T-I-O-N. Investor, all right, which means to give you an ability. Now, why am I bringing this up? Often in our churches, we are used to what is called the quickening of the spirit. And the quickening of the spirit is where you will feel it. And it will make you want to run and jump. That's quickening. But what we have not learned is the unctioning of the spirit. It's where God is having something done through you. And the church has been so geared to feel the quickening, we don't know when he's unctioning. Why are you bringing this up? Many felt something Sunday that you're like, whoa, I ain't seen that before. And it wasn't no jump up and dance because it was not the quickening of the spirit. It was the unctioning. Notice in the middle of the worship, the, the musicians just kept going. It hit in the crowd. The, the musicians was under the unction. These musicians have worked with me a number of years, and they understand something. When God is moving a certain way and causing something to happen, you just let it be. He's already designed what he wants to do. Genesis chapter 1. It says, and God said, and the spirit moved, unction. We have to learn the difference between being quickened by the spirit and when being unctioned by the spirit. And when God unctions you, this is what we have to learn about how God moves by the gifts of the spirit. I can't wait to teach on that. Because without knowledge, we'll constantly be Respond to the Holy Ghost by a quickening when the Holy Ghost is wanting to unction. This is where healing happens, laying on hands happen. Prophetic utterances take place. This is where God is speaking about a doing. But when you're only used to him quickening, you get blinded by his unction. And I want to say to this body, we're going to learn about his unctioning and how to move him when he's speaking on a movement. I had some people who were here, who were here on Sunday from Detroit. They had tattoos everywhere, rings up and through here. And they were in this service and they came by invitation. They left out of here weeping non-church goers. When I left up out of the service, I went and met with them, laid hands on them, and began to pray. And when I said they wept, they wept. And these are people who are hardcore. And when I say hardcore, hardcore, hardcore. But when they experienced the unctioning of the Spirit, and they were like, what is this? And they cried out there on the sidewalk. And the one said, I'm moving back to this city. I've never experienced nothing like this in my life, and this is going to be my church. God is unctioning. 
When they come in not looking like you, so what? Don't you bother what they look like. Let the spirit do the cleaning. Don't let nose rings and earrings and tattoos bother you. We're calling in fish. Pray that God save them all. The move of the spirit is so important. And we're going to learn when God is telling us, you go lay hands on this person. Out of God's grace, the same Sunday, didn't get a chance to tell me, I'm just running. There was a person and, and the anointing broke out in the house. And the person started purging and I knew it. I said, oh, they're purging. If you don't know what that is, you'll call it a demon and it's not a demon. Everything is not a demon. And I told him, go get the bucket. She's ready to let it out. Did you not go get it? Went and got the bucket, stuck it up under, and everything she had been holding in her from trauma threw up. I promise you deliverance is real. We're going to learn more about unctioning. Laying on hands and helping people to get birth and delivered. Some people need to be purged. Saved and depressed is not God's thing for you. And you can have the Holy Ghost and be in a deep depression and you need to go through deliverance. And everything don't happen at the altar. And stuff need to be learned in the pews and not be afraid of it. And then you gotta not be afraid to confront demons, not when you have more authority. Are y'all hearing me? I'm out of time, way out of time. Thank you all for your giving. May God bless you.